All right, let me make sure I have everything. Suits, check. Laptop, check. All my plugs, blah, 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 check. All right, bathroom bag, check. Recording gear, check. Obnoxious, know-it-all attitude. Definitely have that. Do you live, eat, and sleep in the hotel industry? Looking to brush up on your game? You've come to the right place. Welcome to No Vacancy, the hospitality industry's number one podcast with your host, Glenn Hausman. Hey everybody, your friendly neighborhood Glenn here, and everything's right, so just hold tight. Thank you so much for being with me with me here each and every week on the No Vacancy Podcast. Man! You know I'm excited to have you guys here. I really appreciate all the support and all the love that I am getting. And boy, oh boy, are we having fun as we start 2020 off with what I would say is a big old bang. That's because we're getting ready to uh, start traveling again. The last couple of weeks we've been uh, hanging out in the home office and I've been recovering from a, a long year and all of that kind of good stuff. But that time is over. No, we got to get back there out there on the road. We got to start getting you guys the best stories that we could possibly get. And that's why this week, um, and look out for it, um, all these stories that are going to be appearing on our Facebook page, on our LinkedIn feeds, on my personal LinkedIn feed, all that kind of good stuff. Because we're going down to Extended Stay America in Tampa. They've got a brand new prototype, and I'm pretty excited about seeing this thing because it really symbolizes a, a a new moment for the company. They've been they've been really looking forward to getting this franchising aspect really going, and I think that this particular product is going to really help set the stage for them and their success in the future. So I'm really looking forward to being a part of that. We're going to be shooting a bunch of videos with them. We're going to roll them out um, one at a time, and it's going to be a lot of fun. So check out on uh, Wednesday of this week. I should have a, a story up because of the uh, having their opening party. We'll do a little report from there, and then subsequent weeks, we're going to be talking to all sorts of folks in regards to that, and I'm going to be speaking to their executive team and getting that in a podcast and maybe a video and all of the things that you're coming to learn and love and expect. Another thing that you're going to expect is me telling you to reshape your expectations what an ff and e distribution partner for hospitality should be right you know i'm talking about almo hospitality you're saying to yourself glenn why do you keep talking about almo why because i know they are your go-to partner to simplify ff and e deployments right all right they're going to make you guys uh um, save some money over there they're going to simplify your lives they're going to allow you to put your resources towards doing the things that you love or the other issues that need tending to Why? Because they are the largest independent distributor, professional AV, consumer electronics, major appliances, outdoor furnitures like the Cape Soleil collection, housewares, and much, much more. All right. So today I'm looking forward to we got a little bit of a hodgepodge kind of thing uh, going on with this. The first one we're going to talk to. uh, We got a great interview with uh, Dieter Schmitz. He's an area general manager with the law group out of Washington, D.C. What I think was really cool about being able to tell this story today is Dieter has kind of been known as a specialist for opening hotels, right? And I love exploring all these jobs that we don't all think about when we go into the hospitality industry, right, that are there. Who would have thought when you make that decision to go into the hotel business that there are general managers out there that could possibly just specialize in opening hotels? Well, honestly, Dieter didn't realize he was going to be in that position either. It kind of fell upon him, um, but he's leading the opening team right now for the upcoming rigs in Washington, D.C., opening any week now, scheduled for February 3rd, 2020, and it's going to be the first hotel in the United States with the Lore Collection, which also includes the Pulitzer Amsterdam and Sea Containers London and a lot of other stuff. He's also uh, over uh, overlooking um, upcoming DC hotels, including the Kimpton Carlisle Hotel DuPont Circle. That is going to be pretty freaking cool, right? And then we're going to take our way from the uh, the great capital of the United States of America up to the chilliest part of the country. Yeah, I'm talking about Alaska, people. And that's and we're going all the way up to Fishhook, Alaska, to the Meyer Lake Lodge, where we're going to talk to uh, Steve Solari. Who's created Alaska's premier boutique resort in a former summer camp in the middle of Alaska? How cool is that? We're going to talk all about why he's doing this crazy thing, how he makes it work, and how that 5,000 square foot main clubhouse has been totally renovated and it's really becoming the place for events 
in the Anchorage, Alaska area. How cool is that? Another fun story. I got lots of great stories we're going to be telling here all this year. And if you want to hear some great stories, be sure to check out our Checking In with Anthony and Glenn podcast feed. Why? Because we have got some amazing shows coming out shortly. Uh, Coming up any week now, we got a great podcast that we recorded with John Russell. He's the interim CEO right now with RLH Corporation. We talked to him. You know, you guys, if you don't know him, you will after this because it's such a great interview talking with an icon uh, that's been around in the hotel business uh, for a very, very long time. And we talk all about his journey through the hospitality industry, his military career, what made him a great executive. And of course, we talk about the elephant in the room. What's going on over at RLH Corporation as they are trying to change directions and make sure that they can get new leadership in place to take this great company into the, the future. And then we've got another great interview coming up very, very soon. I loved recording one with the one and only travel channel icon, Samantha Brown. Okay, maybe she's not a hotelier, but man, oh man, I love myself some Samantha Brown. She really inspired me. Um, She's the type of person that I had always hoped to be back in the day when it comes to doing something on uh, TV when I dreamed of doing that sort of thing. You know, we all have uh, silly, silly dreams. And uh, mine was to say, uh, hey, this hotel's great. Well, I guess I do that now. I just don't do it on the Travel Channel anyway. It's a bunch of ghosts anyway. Who cares about ghosts? But I do care about Samantha Brown. You're going to love both those interviews on the Checking In with Anthony and Glenn feed. Uh, Go check that out because our newest interview on there is with uh, Taylene Staub. She runs uh, True Hotel. So a lot of great interviews to complement this No Vacancy series. Please go check that out. And, of course, check out our Hotel Design podcast. We've got a great interview with Siobhan. Then we got another great interview on our Hotel Design Podcast with Siobhan Barry, and she is with Gensler. We talk all about how to create a great bar type of atmosphere in life and also the development of bars and nightclubs and stuff over the last 20, 30 years. You're going to like that one, too. And, of course, check out our Hotel Tech Podcast. we got some new episodes ready to drop. Brand new season. Super duper excited about all of this kind of stuff. But most of all, I really appreciate that every one of you are here with me. It is so wonderful to have you guys join me. Make sure you text the word hotel to 66866 to subscribe and check out everything you can on NoVacancyNews.com. Please like the Facebook page. Follow us on LinkedIn. If you're not connected with me on LinkedIn, what are you waiting for? Connect with me. I'm here. Let's connect. Let's chat. Let's create a great community here in hospitality. I want to thank you guys for being here. Remember, you've got one life. So blaze on. All right, I am back now with uh, Dieter Schmitz. And what I, what I really like about uh, Dieter is this guy seems to, uh, he's a general manager, but not your typical type of general manager. No, he's not the guy that's coming in and helping you run your hotel. He's the guy that comes in and helps open your hotel. I haven't had a lot of experience talking to folks like this. So I'm really looking forward to it. Uh, Dieter, how are you doing today, man? I'm doing great. I'm doing great. I'm freezing on the East Coast, but uh, as a SoCal native, I'm never going to get used to this. But other than that, doing doing amazing. Well, that is that is really tragic. I feel terrible for you being cold down there in the uh, Washington, D.C. area, where right now he's preparing to open the Riggs Washington, D.C., which is going to be coming in early 2020 to 900 F Street. If you guys know your uh, D- your DC, that's in the northwest uh, quadrant of the uh, the city down there. So, uh, you know, uh, dear, I think maybe before we get uh, into this whole conversation, how cool is it that you're now opening what looks like a pretty luxurious property in Washington DC? Yeah, this is you know, I I love being a part of unique, non cookie cutter type concepts in hotels, and this this building, this Riggs National Bank, that you know has been here for a hundred plus years. It's just such a historic building and such a prime location, and you know I I love that we're not we're not stuck in a segmentation. You know it's a it's a luxury product, but we're 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 not grouping ourselves as luxury, and we're not grouping ourselves as lifestyle, and we can really go in and do our own thing and create a a different culture that resonates with guests. Which is why I'm in this business. I you know I I love building a culture from scratch, and and when you're given a building like this and a product like this, it's it's pretty epic. Yeah, that is pretty epic. And this property, when it opens, is going to have, I think, 181 guest rooms, which is going to be uh, pretty cool. And what I like about it is it definitely looks, from the uh, the pictures you have online right now, it looks like it's 
pretty classic type of a hotel with a lot with some modern twists on it. So it's uh, it feels to me as if you're honoring the history of DC, you're honoring the history of the building, but you're also not sticking to old outdated trends. Yeah, exactly. We, you know, the our designer Yaki Strauss, he he did a Pulitzer round in Amsterdam, which I don't know if you've seen that property, but nope. stunning. I was just there last week. Um, but he really invoked the, the spirit of the former bank and then preserving and restoring as much as we can, but then obviously, you know, modernizing us and making us a, a great product for, for our guests. Um, and then we, we do have a pretty robust F and B offering with cafe rigs and then downstairs with silver lion who's, you know, they do some amazing concepts. So, um, it's very exciting. Yeah, that is, that's, uh, that's pretty cool. But you know, we can, we can talk about hotel design all day long, but we'll save that for the hotel design podcast. I really want to uh, speak to you today about what it's like opening a, opening a property and then examining their, your career a little bit, how you found your way. But let's use this rigs DC as a, as a great launching point. So at what point are you brought into the process of a new hotel opening? You know, you usually, I'm usually the first or, or sometimes the second hire after the DOS. It just really depends on the property. Um, but, you know, it's usually anywhere from a year or more that you're brought on. Um, sometimes less, you know, at, at some of them I've done less than six months, which is more of a sprint. Um, but, you know, you're, you're brought on the start and that's, that's what is the best part about this is you, you know, you're hiring 250 plus employees and there's, there's not a single employee there and you can really start to just chip away at it higher by higher you form your EC and you know I am always just personality based and making sure we're just a cohesive group that everyone's willing to help each other and what what I think I'm addicted to is that you don't have any excuse right like if you're going in to fix a hotel there's people there before you're, you're dealing with culture that's very very hard to change in some cases this is all on you and, and you can really create that cohesiveness and and a differentiating guest experience from scratch so you know, obviously you're never going to make 100% perfect hires, but I think what I love is is you can build your own identity. And then, you know, when you go back to the property, like every time I go back to Manhattan and I visit my teams from the three that I was there with IHG for five years, it's, it's home. And hopefully that continues on for years and years past when you're gone, if you're doing it right. Yeah, that's a, that's pretty fascinating. So you come on board, you come out on, on board a year or six months if you're uh, not fortunate enough. And what is that process like? Is it mostly about hiring or... Does a lot of it have to do with getting the uh, the property itself put together and ready in ship shape condition? I mean, I think it's both. You know, you're you're obviously you have to make sure that all of your OS and E's in line, and that you you understand what your concept and what your guest experience is going to be before you even start to recruit. Uh, making sure that you're really aligned on that. But I think you know it's it's a lot of just preparing and planning, and then continually evolving that planning. I mean, I, this will be my seventh in a row and you're never going to get the building on the day that you're anticipating it. So it's just lots of adjusting and, and, and game planning on the fly and, and going with, you know, the, the, the flow. I think usually you go, you get into this building when they allow you and, and then you got to get it turned quickly because you've been right. waiting for so long. And um, so, yeah, it's, a, it's, a, it's, I think it's a lot of initial planning where it's just you and, and two other people. And then you take that. And then, you know, once you get it into the two month out and one month out, it's just so fun to see the team double, triple, quadruple. And then that last month you're onboarding, obviously, you know, 80% of your staff and you blink. And then the next thing you know, your first guest is checking in. And it's just this, uh, it's just adrenaline and a, in a high that I think also is a little masochistic in a way because, you know, I, I do it and then the hotels are flowing and then, you know, I want to just do it again and again so I can have these openings and these properties you know, around the country that I could always go back to and be proud of. But I always do say at this point where we're standing, where we're about two months out, that this will be my last opening ever. And then the first day we open, I want to do it again. <laughs> right. That sounds like uh, everything that's hard in life. It seems like um, you just want to get to the finish line, but then you're going to miss being addicted to all of that, uh, all of that challenge, right? Yeah, for sure. Yeah. All right, so what's it like, um, you know, setting out to create the corporate culture through good hires? What comes first? The hires? the culture, discussions about the culture and what the hotel wants to be? How does all of that come together to inform you before you even start um, putting an ad in the newspaper or up on, online to get people to come in the door? So, I mean, the, the, the culture, culture, corporate culture, sorry, is, is definitely something that I always want to try to avoid. And I think, 
you know, you can even do that. What I loved about my time with IHG is I was starting brand new brands, like even Hotel was our wellness brand. So I think you can really create something that's different than what other employees that have maybe worked for the larger companies are used to. Um, I love independence, for example, like we don't have a playbook or an SOP that you're building that from scratch with your team. But I think first and foremost, it's just sitting in a room and saying like, look, what's our guest experience? Like, how are we going to differentiate ourselves in a market like DC where you're looking and you say, okay, there's long established luxury assets um, that everyone knows about here. And then there's a lot of lifestyle players, but there's no one that's doing a little bit of both where you can have a luxury physical product, which we do have, but you can still also have like that unscripted person, personal ability of a lifestyle concept, but that maybe isn't overly casual or trying too hard, you know? And I think that's what we saw here was, look, there's this huge gap. There's not a single hotel that's in the middle. And, and I think that makes people uncomfortable that we, right. we aren't putting ourselves in either basket because you tend to be forced to. And I don't really agree with that. And I think here, if you're in a position where you can, you can kind of be your own little segmentation. So I think we started there. And then and when you're given a product like this, or, you know, most of my openings have been new builds, you really don't have any excuse or worry except for normal building issues that are going to be the pains of a brand new property. So you just sit in a room and, and you say, what what are travelers really looking for today? And I think what, what I loved about even was that resonated. It, these weren't like, huge hotels with loads of amenities we were 150 rooms to 230 rooms in manhattan against 500 hotels but both those even you know that even then we opened in times square it got to number one on trip advisors top 25 right. in the u.s and that was solely because it was a different guest experience and people are just so hungry for that nowadays that if you can unscript your employees and make it genuine everyone asks you know well that sounds really simplistic but it's actually critical it's it's something that a lot of hotels can't provide. And if you can like hire the right personalities, let that shine and, and be, you know, if you're this corporate traveler that travels 200 plus nights a year and you're just so used to the same thing, if you're being a member, well, well, you know, here's your keys, here's your welcome amenity. <laughs> right. And you can give them something else that's like, hey, we, we actually like really care that this is a different experience and you leave feeling better than when you arrived. I think it just goes such a long way. And that's, that's what I love doing. Like I can't be, I would be the worst possible GM if I'm given a cookie cutter brand and told to bring it to life, like I, I would be horrible. Right. And I think I'm very cognizant of that. Like I need, I need independence to do unique guest experiences for sure. That's pretty cool. And uh, even definitely is uh, doing that sort of thing. Now the properties that you opened, were those the ones that are owned by Concord? No, we, um, the properties I opened in Manhattan had an individual owner. His name is okay. Steinberg. So he owns all three, All right, but he, he was the first owner for the even brand. And then, um, yeah, at that point we, we were the second and third even I opened the first ever, which IHG owned and we got a lot of the kinks out and then, um, it's starting to grow and it's going internationally and the wellness, as I'm sure you've spoken about and now it's not a gimmick. It's a, it's a real thing that travelers need and want. And I think it was, it was awesome because we were, I think we were pretty ahead of everyone else that's now every I single agree. company has some sort of wellness. Yeah, man, Dieter, um, I got to tell you, Dieter, uh, even is definitely doing things right. I think they're very on trend. And um, back when those hotels opened, I guess you were working with Adam Glickman, who was still um, shepherding that brand? Or had he already? Uh, yeah, it was, I watched even with Adam, and Adam's now doing yep. uh, wellness. He has his own wellness consulting firm, and he's doing a great sure job does. for wellness resorts around the, around the world. And I mean, if anyone I've ever met that understands wellness, he's he's the guru. Yeah. Um, so to be able to bring that to life with him was was really awesome. And then you know we saw it right away in Manhattan, like oh my god, this that hotel ran ninety five percent since the day we opened. Oh. It was the highest host had it, beating all Intercon brands, Intercons, oh Indigos, goodness. everything. And it was like, crap, people love this. And I just wish we could get to a thousand quickly, you know? Right. Yeah, I, I wish so too, because it's really one of those brands that I think deserve to, to have more um, mind share in the consumer's zeitgeist, right? Because they really are hitting on, on all of those things. So at the Ritz Hotel, it seems like it's more about you creating the culture and the programming along with the ownership, of course. But with something like even, it's more of uh, more distributed between what the brand is looking to create, along with what you're hoping to uh, accomplish. So, what are some of the um, the nuances and opportunities and challenges with working on both of those sides of the equation? Yeah, I mean, I think it was you know with IHG, I loved being a part of that company because they they 
they do really respect the GM as, as the operator of the building. And I think, you know, mm-hmm. in the even case with Adam, you have a great brand team and they, they, they put what the brand should look like on paper and then they come into a hotel and then you as an operator can kind of say what you just don't feel works for your guest experience. And I think, you know, as long as either side isn't too defensive and it's productive and, and you get to a good place for what's actually doable from an operational standpoint, I think sometimes brand teams, you know, they have grander ideas that just don't work for an agent that's stuck there all day. Right. Um, and you, you just try to come to the best place. And then obviously, you know, things change quickly after you open when you realize, okay, some of these ideas were just a little too much. And I think in, in the case of even when we first started, we were really, really heavy on the fitness. And then we quickly realized like, look, wellness is different things to different people. We're talking people's ears off about working out that really it's like we have these amazing sleep experience and great cocktails and healthy food. So you just got to really understand what that specific guest is there and what their wellness story is. And if it's just having a great cocktail and having a personal guest experience, then so be it. Um, so I think in that case, it was a great example of we quickly amended what we were going for, which is like, we don't need to talk about the interim fitness zones and the fitness center with the best equipment in the world if you're not going to work out. Um, right. So it's, it was really just understanding what every traveler there is for. And then in the case like Riggs, you know, we're part of the floor collection. So we have really amazing properties in Amsterdam and London that have done a phenomenal job and great guest experience. So you're, you're creating, trying to duplicate the culture that they had while being true to, you know, your, your specific market in DC. And I think that's a lot of working together with that team, the lore team. And here it's a lot different, right? We're, we're a small company. It's a little bit more like, you, you know, and see and touch everyone. And I'm, you know, I, very close with the COO and we have conversations daily. So it's, it's different than with an IHG where it's a, it's a ginormous company. Um, so, you know, you're able to change things probably a little bit quicker than you would in a, in a corporate environment, but conversely, the stress is, I would say for sure, a little higher in an independent because it, you know, you're not given a handbook and these brands have handbooks, companies have these procedures. And, and what I love about this is you're, you're building that from scratch. So, that, that that adds a little bit more stress on an opening when you know you're you're not only hiring the right team and bringing this to life, but you're also making sure that you have all your procedures in place to you know be a profitable business. Right, and um, I'm sh- the, the the thing that struck me most is you, you're talking about opening and then having to change stuff because stuff sometimes works, sometimes stuff that's a great idea does not practically work in the uh, the real world. So as a guy that opens hotels. How long do you usually stick around after the property opens to, I guess, continually re- to refine the process that you launched? I mean, I, it, you know, it's varied anywhere from a year to, I was in New York for five years with, mm-hmm. with those hotels. So I think, you know, you, in Manhattan, it's just like the pace is so crazy and it's probably the best place ever to open a hotel because you're going to open and you're going to be at 95%. And, you know, that, right. that's a great problem to have. Um, but I think something like this with rigs, you know, it, it's it's a long term hold and a long term investment where you, it will take a long time to, you know, this is a very very competitive market here in DC Extremely. and, and mm-hmm. uh, it's it's exciting for me to see, you know, we're very confident we're going to deliver and create this our own unique segmentation and, um, you know, we also we have some other assets in DC that I'll oversee and I think. Um, you know, you never set a time frame where you say, okay, after one, one year, I'm ready for the next. It's just, right. I get this feeling where in New York, those three hotels were rolling. I was right. so proud of what we did. My team was ready to be promoted. And it, it, you kind of got to do say, okay, now it's time for the next right. person to step in. And I've yeah. done everything I could. It's like you kind of, um, over a couple of weeks, probably come to the realization that your, your time is done here. It's time to, to yeah. move on to the next challenge and excitement, right? Yeah. And you want to like, uh, you know, you have your owners and your owners are like your, your family. And so when you leave that conversation, frankly sucks. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, you got to make sure that the, the hotel continues to flow. And that you know, I, I, I'm proud of, I can go back to my hotels and you know, all my owners listening to this will roll their eyes, but that they caught me for life. And that, uh, right. Uh, you know. <laughs> <laughs> uh, all right. I want to talk a little bit about uh, hiring because uh, you know, we're pretty much at full employment here. So how do you, fill up all of those slots for opening day because I can't imagine that you can hire somebody in September or October and say we're going to open in January or February hang out on the sidelines for a while how does all how does that process work 
Yeah, I mean, you, we start extremely early and you just try to find, so it, everyone does this differently, but mine's a little more exhausting where we're hiring the personality. So I want to meet every single player. Right. Um, so I interview everyone from housekeeping to agents and we start right away. Once I have my EC on, we've been interviewing here for the last four months. Mm-hmm. Um, and that when you find the right talent, then it is, like you said, you're, right. you're, you're trying to keep them engaged for months, which can be difficult. And you also have to, you know, be realistic that there's going to be some that unfortunately you can't keep on on the radar for that long. Um, but it's it's a pretty exhaustive process, to be honest. If you're looking at like what it takes to be an agent with rigs, you're going through, you know, you're going through HR, you're going through our, our director of rooms, our director of ops, and you're finishing with myself. Um, so there's layers upon layers of just personality checks, making sure they're fitting into this culture, which we're all extremely aligned on. Um, and then, you know, not feeling the pressure to settle or, you know, if you open less than what was budgeted, then as long as you have the right people that can really dive in. And yeah, I think I drive, uh, I drive some of my managers crazy because I start at the front desk. So if there's a line, I'm going to help. And I think right. as long as everyone has that same mindset, you're always going to be fine with the right players. Good. And it's, uh, it strikes me now as we're having this conversation on um, opening day, you know, you've got to ramp up. And unlike New York, where boom, you, you might get to that 95 percent real quick. It does take a slower, longer period of time. And to me, that indicates that maybe you don't need a full complement of staff and you can you can get away with having fewer people because there are fewer rooms to service and fewer people to take care of. Yeah, that's it's very accurate. And I think, you know, some people, some openings, unfortunately, make the mistake of going full staff and then you don't ramp up fast enough and the worst possible thing you could ever do to your coach momentum is have to lay off your team um so i'm a big fan on starting a little leaner and then ramping up like sure if we open and it's gangbusters and we're at 95 percent, it's a great problem to have and then you ramp but i think the vice versa that just that kills teams when you're when your coworkers are being cut right off the bat right um so i'm always very 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 careful on that and just respecting like if these are people's lives and you have to be smart and and realistic about what a ramp up is um but you know there's a lot harder markets than dc as well dc has a pretty healthy occupancy um you know if you're opening some some markets in socal that are very seasonal that's that's right. very difficult depending on when you open yeah because it might make sense to open in a, a real uh fallow period before uh, before everything really ramps up for whatever season is, is coming right, for, exactly. for them. Um, so what's the biggest difference in creating a corporate culture for a brand such as Even in Manhattan versus the Riggs type of a property in Washington, D.C.? Now, of course, you're going to tell me everyone has to have the culture of excellence and be really um, hospitable, but there are different types of personalities probably that you're looking for for those types of respective properties. Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, at even it's everyone had to have some, some sort of wellness story and they right. had to be able to, to to speak to a guest about whatever their wellness story is, if it's cooking or loving wine or, um, you know, running or working out. I think here it's it is just a genuine love for for hospitality. And D.C. actually has like a very up and coming, booming food scene. That's pretty exciting. You know, Manhattan, obviously, it's been a leader forever. Um, but D.C., like. Just, it's at this crux right now where we're finding with recruiting for F and B, it's just like this crazy energy that word of mouth spread about um, what our outlets are here. And I think the biggest difference, obviously, from rigs to to the even is just our F and B is it's a ginormous part of this hotel. You know, we we have these beautiful, beautiful outlets with cafe rigs, and then downstairs right. with Silver Lion. And so that's that really is a, half of our staff is F and B, and bringing that to life will be critical. And when you look at that compared to a, a normal F and B outlet at some of the corporate brands, you know, when you're a outlet in a corporate brand in Manhattan, guests aren't coming to Manhattan to eat in a hotel. And that's just the reality, unless you're one of the very few that has a great restaurant. Right. Right. Um, it's, you may go to the bar, have a drink, but you're going out to the restaurants in Manhattan Heck yeah. here in our city. <laughs> yeah. You're, you're getting your steak at quality meats or whatever. Um, here in DC, it's, you know, we, we need to be standalone successes in our outlets for the community and, and we're in the prime location to do so. But this is a fun challenge where these, the, our cafe rigs and then downstairs at Silver Line, like, these, these gotta be a hit with the community. This has to be somewhere that people are coming in for date nights and, right. and they will be. They're, they're beautiful products, but the hotel alone will not be able to, to facilitate guests in there to, to the ability we need. So that's what's exciting to me is like these are, these are really, really fun F&B products.
Right. So that's probably though, the biggest difference between the two. Right. And though a little bit off topic, I, I think Dieter there has made it a, a very important point about always having to appeal towards a local community with your food and beverage program, because no matter where you are, unless you're at a resort that's in the middle of nowhere, people are naturally going to want to go off and explore the ones that are staying in your hotel. So you got to draw those people in. But Dieter, I'm very curious as to how the heck did you find your way into being a guy that specializes in opening hotels. I can't imagine that you came um, out of school going, I want to be that guy. How'd you fall into it? Yeah, no, I mean, I, I mean, I, my uncle was in hospitality, so I followed him around at a really young age. And I, I just, I got really lucky. Like I just always loved the moving parts that it takes to make a hotel tick. I mean, I remember being like six years old, being like amazed by how many different departments are working together. Just to have one guest stay go flawlessly. But um, you know, I, I got my training in, in resorts and I thought I was just going to work my way up in resorts. And then I joined IHG to, to open the Indigo in San Diego. And that was my first opening, which at that time was oh my a new goodness. brand Are you serious? IHG. Yeah. The guest, I was, have you been I, there? I, I, I'm sure we met <laughs> back, in the, <laughs> back in the day. Yeah. Cause I remember uh, going there on press events, like before it opened. Yeah. I think it was happening in conjunction when um, Alice was down there for a couple of years. Yeah, it was. LA5, yeah. Right. And uh, one yeah. thing that, that really struck me was um, how cool it was being able to look over the uh, the ballpark. And I've yeah. actually stayed there a couple of times too when I got uh, when I was trying to leave like Alice and got stuck in snowstorms. So I, I know that property <laughs> very well, and it's a great property. It is, and it, it still feels. I mean. I was just there. It still feels very new too, which, you know, it's been like over 10 years, but I, that was my first opening I did. And I just loved it. I thought it was the coolest thing ever, like just going through that stress together and then having that first guest <laughs> come. And I, 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 I can look back and just like my eyes, you know, like, Oh my God, this is, this is so amazing. And, you know, I had done the resorts before. So to like really have that energy and just, the sheer like drama of it all because your first review like you're either 100 percent or you're zero <laughs> and that's <laughs> terrifying um, and you know i i love that just from that was when i was you know working the desk and then i was there for a good two and a half years and then i really wanted to do some independence because i knew the power and importance that diversifying right. that would be so i opened shore hotel in santa monica which is right across from the pier and just like such an epic location and great property and awesome. um you know that was that was kind of quintessential like you're starting from scratch there is no sap it's a family that owns this building and mm -hmm. you and your ec are just going at it and we didn't have a gm so i kind of handled all the gm inquiries and that was the first time i was kind of like the, the front runner right um, and then from there i did another independent out in um, san diego lake house right on this awesome handmade lake which was a that was a very cool challenge because you're taking a really tired two-star and you're making it this great resort and um the, the gentleman eat drink sleep i don't know if you're aware of tower 23 and pd but um, nope. brett miller does a great job on these lifestyle boutique hotels so it was really cool to, to work with him and then while i was there i got contacted by ig to launch this cool new wellness brand and i thought it was just like such an amazing concept i was living at the resort in san diego at 75 degrees year round and then i had moved to the east coast and in uh did five years in manhattan and opened three properties for us at ig and then um, you know, that would made it six in a row. And then now here I am wow. with uh, going back to the independent space. I think, you know, it's, I just want to continually, I think you, when you're going back and forth, it keeps you on your toes, it keeps you, keeps you accountable and creative and yeah. um, trying to find new ways to kind of push yourself and your team. And this is exciting for me, like I said, just because of how critical F and B is for us. Yeah, that sounds, uh, that sounds great. So um, being that F and B is so critical, it kind of like, um, start to add another layer to your skill set because it sounds to me as if this is um, more of uh, F and B than you've ever dealt with before and kind of with a little bit different personality than you've dealt with before. Yeah, definitely a more of a unique personality. And, and like you said, just understanding how important it is that we resonate within the neighborhood, which I think I've quickly learned, like you can't underestimate that. Like you have to genuinely care about being a, a player and a, and a partner in your neighborhood, no matter where you are. Right. Um, I think it's just it's absolutely critical for a new opening and if you don't and you do that disingenuously in, in a market like DC it, it will not work um, so you know I think it's like you're just going like condo to condo meeting the neighbors in the neighborhood and um, you know you want that you want to be their home away from home for, for their guests and their visitors and 
I think that takes a lot of time when you're in a GM role, but I think it's, it's pretty critical to not underestimate how absolutely paramount that is. Otherwise, you're just a hotel trying to make money in the neighborhood, right. you know, kind of bring their people there. So what are some of the most important skills that you feel that you've needed to acquire as you become kind of a hotel opener specialist? Uh, you quickly being realistic that you're going to make mistakes. I think in the, as long as you make a lot more good decisions than those few mistakes, uh-huh. I think, you know, I, I probably started out wanting to, to have the perfect opening and then realized that, that will never, ever happen. Um, and if it does, it's because probably my standards have gone down. <laughs> and I think <laughs> um, it's, it's been being very like, you, you gotta be, you have to be self-critical and aware that like, look, you, you're going to make probably 10,000 decisions and then opening more than that. And you just got to make sure the major ones play out. And then that, you know, the ones that, that don't quite, that you adjust very, very quickly. And I think you can plan and plan and plan for what a guest experience is going to be the day you open, but right. the guests dictate what makes that special. You don't. Um, so it's, it it's, sounds easier than you need to have flexible thinking, right? You can't get locked <laughs> into something because either your ownership is going to have a different idea or the guests are just going to do things in a way that's completely different than you expected them to. Yeah, extremely flexible thinking. And I think it's just from the day you open, that's why guest feedback, it's just so critical to, you know, I, I sometimes joke, I wish I was a GM where it was just comic card days and not all the and trip advisors of the world. Cause I think the stress would have been a lot less. Um, but you know, that's our reality now is you, those sites matter and uh, you got to take them seriously and you, right. you have to be fiercely protective of her adjusting quickly. Uh, Cause you get one shot at this. And I think that's the biggest pressure is just understanding that you, you get one shot and you, you have to not be too proud to change. And I think when you, when you have a big brand that that's sometimes a little more difficult where you have to basically fight with the brand and say like, look, I'm, I can't risk this. We got to mend and and go. And you got to be able to probably fight a little bit, a little bit more than in an independent situation where you can just make the call. Yeah, that makes, that makes sense. Sounds like, uh, I think there was a, a 1980s deodorant commercial that focused on, you never get a second chance to make a first impression. It sounds exactly like, uh, that's what you're doing, but hopefully uh, not having to worry about uh, deodorizing anything over there. Um, so wrapping up, I think it's time for you to give a good shameless plugs for uh, Riggs DC and anything else that's on your mind right now, Dieter. Oh, yeah. No, we would love everyone to come check us out. We open in early 2020. Uh, so, you know, hopefully around February, March range, we don't have a specific date yet, but we would love to have everyone come to Riggs DC. I'll be there in the lobby. I'd love to meet everyone and, um, it's RiggsDC.com and, uh, any other plugs, I, I guess just for the up and comers, I think it's important. I, I really just always want to, to do a shout out to everyone that's, that's growing in the industry, wondering, you know, how do I become a GM just to, to believe. I think yeah. I had, I had someone when I was, 21 tell me you'll never be a gm before you're 35 and i think right if you stick with this industry and you work your tail off and you're just a good leader to people i uh-huh. i want everyone to know stick with it because it's a great industry that that is very rewarding right that's awesome um so i want to thank you so much for, for being here how cool is that listeners out there right i mean who would have thought that you could be a, a specialist in opening hotels. There are so many great jobs out there and jobs that you may not have even thought about. So I'm very excited that we had this conversation. I'm excited that you guys listen to this conversation. And of course, uh, if you haven't subscribed to our newsletter, be able to uh, be sure to just text the word hotel to 66866. That's hotel to 66866. And you'll get our weekly newsletter. So stick around because after this commercial break, we've got another great interview with another amazing hospitality professional. Thanks for listening. We'll see you on the other side of the commercial break. Have a question for your host, Glenn? Tweet him now at Traveling Glenn. No vacancy. The hospitality industry's number one podcast will be right back. Hey, everybody. Glenn here. And listen, for nearly 50 years, that's incredible, nearly 50 years, Red Roof has been proven that value and quality can exist on the same piece of real estate. And that's true across every Red Roof offering. Right off the bat, Red Roof Inn can boast some of the highest rev pars in its segment and has been number one in online reviews nine years running. While Red Roof Plus 
is the brand extension that created the upscale economy market and is having a dramatic impact on owners' financial results. And I know this, guys. I've interviewed some of these owners, and they love this product. Then, of course, there's Red Collection, a group of upper mid-scale, unique city-centric hotels inspired by each area's vibe and cultures. You know how essential that is, right? And it is going to help franchisees with the opportunity to affordably invest in new markets. And for those looking to get into the explosively fast growing extended stay market, you know, that trend that I keep talking about for the last few years, why aren't you in on it yet? Well, get in on it now, because you've got hometown studios and the chance to gain all the perks of doing business with Red Roof. In fact, from upscale economy to extended stay to city centric in 2020, you can't afford to ignore Red Roof. Get that ball rolling and call Matt Hostetler. He's Red Roof Senior VP of Development and Franchising. You know that. You see him at all the shows. You see him absolutely everywhere. He's a guy you want to do business with. Give him a ring at 713-576-7426 or email him at mhostetler at redroof.com. That's M-H-O-S-T-E-T-L-E-R at redroof.com. Happy 2020, everyone. All right, so one of the things that we never talk enough about on this show is some of the more unusual places that people are building hotels, and that's Alaska. Now, hey, if you've followed any of my coverage from the uh, the lodging conference, I was speaking to the good folks over at Remington, and they've got a property up there in Alaska, too, and it got me thinking. Let's talk more about this incredible environment. Well, you know, as long as it exists, still is in Alaska. I don't want to make any global uh, warming comments here and all like that. But because of that, I've got uh, Mr. Uh, Steve Solari, and he is with Meyer Lake, a resort that's about 50 minutes from the Anchorage Airport in Wasilla. Steve, great to see you. How cool is it that you developed a hotel in a place that other folks would say, no, this is not for me? <laughs> you know, I hear that all the time. Of course, because um, it's so unusual. It's yeah. not like putting a hotel in downtown Manhattan. Everybody wants to do that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, um, people, uh, even people that produce, you know, uh, other boutique properties, they always say, oh, God, I would never. It's too far. <laughs> right. Yeah. Um, so w- as a hotel developer, what attracted you to doing something that's so out of the bounds of what we in the traditional hotel industry consider, uh, you know, normal doing a little air quote routine there? Um, I think the opportunity to do boutique in a market that, um, you know, doesn't really exist was sort of very interesting to me. Um, the property was so big, um, uh, about 160 acres. Um, that we thought, why not uh, flip this sleepy former church camp into something, you know, really interesting that we could, you know, do group travel with or, you know, sort of not have the typical big box hallway experience for people. So tell me a little bit about the resort. What is it like? What is it like? What is its point of view? Um, how did it all come together for you? So uh, the owners of the property were investors in a line of men's traveling gear I had, and they said, hey, we love your tastes. We trust your instincts. You should come look at this this thing we bought. <laughs> and uh, I had started um, consulting on it from that point. And, um, you know, 160 acres, a private 40-acre lake, uh, you know, beautiful mountain views in every direction. Um, the neighborhood was super hungry for a new wedding venue, so we knew that we could do that sort of immediately. And, um, and we did. And, and while we were sort of running almost 20 weddings that first season, um, Holy cow. we, yeah, yeah. And an insane market for that here. Um, we flipped, um, the main lodge, uh, in about two years. The realities of doing construction up here are so that you have maybe a five month window to get it all done. Um, and then, uh, the second season we spent all redoing the lodging, which is 12 rooms, um, spread across five beautiful cabins wow so you had to go a uh, an entire winter like half built not open that must be very yeah, stressful yeah. for you when you're thinking about the economics of putting everything in and uh, i'm just thinking about the time frame let alone that how much money it's got to cost in order for you to get any sort of materials not just to alaska but then to your building site so the realities of construction as i said earlier um this was such a learning curve for somebody that comes from southern california where right. you can just Go, go, go all the time. And for a guy that's from Southern um, California, you did you do not appear as chilly as I would have expected, being that you're up there in Alaska. <laughs> you know, I hear that a lot. Uh, I'm always the guy that, um, that's running around in shorts if it's over 50 degrees. 
<laughs> yeah. So, um, you know, uh, yeah, we, we, we ran into issues in every direction. Um, it was, uh, I don't think that we could have pulled off a five month overhaul of nine separate buildings without right. an entire season, um, of planning. So, uh, I think we did it well. Yeah, that, uh, that makes sense. So uh, the first thing that st- strikes me here, and I got a lot of questions for you, but you mentioned this wedding venue thing. You did 20 mm-hmm. weddings in the first season. It would never have occurred to me. No, you know, to the end of time that that area would have enough of a community that there are so many weddings going on. Um, how much of it is just from that area as compared to maybe people flying in from another place to have a destination wedding? Uh, I'd say our first year was 100 percent locals. Wow. Um, and that even shocked me. Um, you know, second year we started getting, you know, press that would attract people from other places. Right. You know, OK, I don't want to do anything. Just sort of have this experience ready for us and our friends when we get here. But the first year was 100% locals and, you know, I'd say uh, 60% young people, you know. So it was an interesting mix. So, and, you know, the nice thing about us is that it's just enough Alaska for the half of the couple that's from Texas. <laughs> and it's, you know, Alaska enough for the couple that's from, you know, down the road or maybe, you know, a more remote area. Right, because I think of myself. As a, uh, you know, I'm a New York guy, right? I lived in Manhattan and Brooklyn for 20 plus years. I don't get yeah. this whole snow thing unless, of course, it's at uh, an intersection <laughs> and everybody stepped on it and it's turned into slush, right? Then I have right. to then I have to jump over it. You guys don't have that problem with slush because you're pretty much too, <laughs> too chilly over there. Yeah. But um, I-, I love that idea of just enough Alaska because the reason why I'm saying this is because I feel like I could do Alaska on training wheels, right? So instead of right. going and having to do that cruise thing for me i could come up to you and still feel well rooted in what i'm comfortable with but also i think kind of feel like i'm doing something um exciting and different yes um you know we sort of pride ourselves in uh choreographing the experience for your type of person um so they don't feel like they're um you know uh, getting lost in the weeds or the forest or going to be eaten by a bear. I mean, these are real fears that people have about a place that is very natural um, that I, we sort of laugh at here, but um, at the same time, it's not totally unrealistic. Well, I don't laugh at it because honestly, what I'm familiar with in Alaska are the TV shows that I see about right. those crazy right. folks. And I, I mean, crazy in the sense that I would never do such a thing living out there in the wilderness and being sure. able to do all of this stuff on their own or, uh, you know, that whole family that was up there, the Bush people that then sure. moved out of town and they still yeah. created a show around people that were Alaskan, but not Alaskan <laughs> anymore. I don't get that, yeah. but that's a story yeah. for another podcast. Um, so what is this experience like? I love that um, you sent me this great this, this great package uh, ahead of time. Now, I don't know if that's something you send to uh, everybody, but one of the things that were in it is a sample itinerary, and it really looks like um, you are a complete destination, and you just go there and you stay there, Right. Correct. Um, uh, the people that come to my lake, uh, I sent you two boxes. So the first one yes. was all, all travel guides and stuff like that. So let me yeah. let me just set that up. I love what you do because it was different, and um, you're really cutting through the clutter there, as you actually said in uh, in your note that you uh, attached to me in the second one. I think that's so important today because there are so many choices that people have out there. How do you get into the minds of the customers? So at first, I thought you were just sending that to me because we struck up this conversation. We were going to do this interview, but when that second package came, I said, "Oh wait, this guy is doing something very different." And your resort has now stuck with me simply because you took the time and effort to send a, uh, a couple of fun packages my way. Listen, uh, you know, uh, thank you. And we're, that is something that we do to people, you know, for people that have an interest. They get to a certain point and we start sending them information. Right. You know, obviously not every phone call gets this. But, yeah, of course. Um, you know, uh, we sent you the big package with all of the guides thinking, okay, everybody says the same thing. Mm-hmm. Okay, Mr. Solari, this, this state is too, um, it's too big. We, or, you know, we don't have time to look at all these things. Um, it's exciting and interesting. We like what we see, but we need somebody to help us. So we very quickly realized that it's too big and we had to cut it up for them. So uh, the second pass with our customers is, okay, let's send them a sample itinerary and see what their interests are. And they start uh, digging into those books. They'll re, they'll re, uh, look at them. The kids will start getting involved. And the third or fourth phone call with us, uh, is, or with a team member, a concierge member here at Meyer Lake is, okay, what have you extracted from those? And how, how excited are you about five different things? 
and how can we work those into them? Right. I think that's pretty cool. So it was a, it was a lot of fun that you you bring that stuff to it because now I feel indelibly connected to it in in a sort of way. You sent some fun <laughs> you know stuffed animals that are over there yeah. and uh, some great uh, socks, which I think is a. Uh, is is really fantastic. I plan on uh, wearing a pair of these at a conference that I'm going to be doing real soon. So uh, we'll plug sure. in a little bit. The one thing I didn't realize you needed was a can cooler insula- insulation koozie. I would have thought my beer would stay cold <laughs> up there. <laughs> you know, uh, that happens to be one of my personal favorite things that Alaska has as a souvenir. So that's definitely me. <laughs> I like, Yeah, I definitely like the irony. But maybe it's to keep my beer from freezing. Because it's so cool. Right, exactly. Right. There you go. <laughs> uh, you know, I'd like to address this sort of common misconception. Um, I, I I travel all over the place sort of selling this experience now, you know. Um, and people say, oh, my God, aren't you, isn't it freezing all the time? No, it's not. You know, we have these four months during summertime where it's 75, 78 degrees and 23 hours of daylight. So I tell Ooh. people that and they're sort of shocked, you know. Uh, Imagine having dinner with your family by the lake in a barbecue, and then you have five additional hours after dinner to have cigars and scotch by the campfire or take a hike, you know, around our property or go in the water, you know? So, um, the cold thing is, uh, it gets old, but it is, um, it is, I guess, part of what we deal with here. No, I, I guess so, and that that makes sense. It's kind of like um, extreme temperatures. I I equate it, yeah. Um, at least from my sense of places that I've been, kind of like um, Banff, which is ninety minutes north or so of totally. like Calgary, where it's nice and great during the summers. It stays really, really light, super late, and right. then in the winters it becomes so horrific it's uh, almost impossible to to get around. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, you can get used to anything, right? <laughs> oh, right. I just keep thinking about, um, you know, I just keep thinking about the um, that scene in uh, The Shining where Dick Halloran, Scatman Crothers, is in that uh, that snow machine right. going up there. I picture right. uh, you driving around in those kind of snow machines without the axe violence associated. A with, very with popular sport here. Yes, yes. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm sure. So, how big is the resort? What uh, you know? Tell me a little bit about that and the types of um, people that you're attracting beyond that wedding crowd so um you know we're around 160 acres so imagine our driveway is a, is a half mile long wow um yeah and um the uh i mean even people in the neighborhood feel like they're in a totally different world when they when they get here so um you know 160 acres everything is really happening on this five or six acre area where all the buildings are but right. um you know the 40 acre lake is it's just jaw dropping. I mean, we hear the same thing over and over again. People, this is a sacred place. You know, uh, I have never been so relaxed. There's something about looking at the water, you know? So, um, I've pus, you know, positioned us as the antidote for modern civilization. You know, you come here, there are no billboards in Alaska. They're, they're outlawed. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, imagine driving with your family for three hours and the only thing that's interrupted your guys' conversation is the street signs or the rivers and right. the bears and the mountains. You know, so it's it's a place unlike any other. And the type of people that's coming here outside of the local population for weddings is a lot of uh, city folks. Uh, we have New Yorkers here all the time. Uh, they want to do two, three, four, five days. Um, I sent you an itinerary, which is our sort of target um, uh, experience. Yeah, it's a seven days, mm-hmm. six nights. Um, this gives you the opportunity to see what we call Alaska's greatest hits. Um, and to really decompress from, you know, wherever it is that you're coming from. Right. I mean, you've got an opportunity to take people up to uh, see glaciers. You go to a school bus hamburger place for uh, for a meal on on one day. You go around your you go around your lake. Oh, I love this charcuterie platter with wine pairings at the lakefront terrace and uh, time for swimming yeah. and boating. Campfires in the evening. Picnic lunches. Explore recreation yeah. areas nearby. So this is a real sort of outdoorsy kind of experience, but in a controlled environment. So people like me who are on those training reels can feel like they're having that extreme experience without having to go so uh, extreme. You know, you mentioned why I, you know, what attracted me to this in the beginning. Uh, I really wanted to bring a a super high-end experience, hospitality element to a place that was wild, you know, um, this has been done before. We've seen interesting versions of this, but Alaska is this place where it's just so undeniable. I mean, you can drive for five hours and it, it looks the same, you know, it, right. it keeps getting wilder. 
So for us to have a very, like you said, uh, measured uh, food and beverage, uh, something that people from New York City would be totally familiar with as far as service and experience and taste and quality. Uh, in a place that was just this complete opposite of their location. Right. It's like it sounds like it's exactly the same here as Long Island, except uh, turn wild into strip malls, and we are we've got the same <laughs> kind of the same kind of thing. But I, I love that you're able to actually dedicate a luxury experience in this sort of uh, scenario. So, how are you able to deliver such high end service in such a uh, you know remote ish location? You know, it's not easy. Um, we pride ourselves in hiring only kids from the neighborhood. Um, and we have found that they're largely terrible at this. Um, but after, after, um, you know, uh, you know, we do a, a fried chicken dinner, uh, during the winter and we start training them for the summer season. So by the time summer rolls around, they are masters at event services. So, um, it's been fun and challenging, but, um, you know, we found local chefs. Uh, the food that's grown here is unlike right. anything else. All the food, meat, vegetables, either grown uh, on the land or hydroponically, uh, the highest quality of everything comes out of out of the little town Palmer nearby, which is Alaska's breadbasket. Wow. So we're integrating everything hyper-localized into the experience. I think that's, uh, that's, that's pretty incredible. So are you doing um, uh, unusual types of uh, meats, for example, maybe uh, I don't know. Maybe I don't know. If people eat moose up there, or how yes. that how that uh, works. People uh, people eat moose. It's a subsistence animal, so you can't right. you know you can't purchase it for sale. And I think um, the, but, uh, uh, maybe it's seals that only native Alaskans are allowed to hunt, or something like that. Correct, too, right? Yeah. yeah, I would never. But yeah. um, you know, it's uh, it's a thing. Um, you know, uh, but uh, we have people who do weddings, and they'll cater it themselves, and mm-hmm. they'll bring in you know, all moose burgers or, right. you know, caribou. And um, so it has been, you know, I would love to integrate some of those things into our food and beverage program, but, you know, uh, unfortunately it would have to be caught by our guests. <laughs> right. <laughs> I totally. has happened I, before. Hey, listen, I totally understand. and whatnot. I totally understand that because I would rather come down on the side of caring about the Alaskan wilderness than, you right. know, poaching it so everybody could feel good and go back to their friends and say, hey, yeah. I had this sort of thing. So um, yeah. I guess the fishing is a little bit different. That's pretty, pretty typical. Yeah. Guess, guess leave, you know, the, the, the girls will, the, you know, the women in the group will do a spa day, you know, downstairs uh, or a cooking class in the kitchen with a local chef. And then the guys will go out fishing. And then that chef, for example, will still be here to do a deboning uh, filleting opportunity to learn for the guys, for the kids. I really so like that. Um, you know, mm-hmm. yeah, we're typically, you know, um, our, 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 our target guest is big family, you know, or group family travel. I mean, we found a lot of success in these three or four families coming up at a time and renting the entire place, right. getting that type of itinerary that I sent you. And I swear the kids in every situation, the parents are jaw dropped on the beach because the kids have found the, uh, canoes. They found the life jackets and they're swimming in the water within 20 minutes of exiting the bus. That's a, uh, that's really cool. Cause I'm, I'm sitting here as you're talking, thinking about the struggle that I'm having. And I've got, um, teenage boys that are, uh, twins and uh, 15 and a half right now. And yeah. I'm finding it to be a struggle dealing with all of this screen time stuff. So yes, I sir, love the absolutely. idea of really separating them from that, making a, a hard Look, break. I, I've seen this all the time. There's, n- it's not going to happen. Okay. Uh, you're not going to make it happen. The only thing that's going to make it happen, uh, is them finding something that would uh, detract them from it. And in my experience here, and this is what we are so, uh, passionate about is the nature is so overwhelming and people, you know, from New York City, from Los Angeles, from San Antonio, there's no reference for this anywhere, you right. know, um, and they're just completely separated from it on their own. And the kids, um, you know, we've had teenagers here and, and they have just as high quality as experience as the little ones. Um, and while they're not free from it, they do separate enough to where they make mention of it. Wow, I don't know where my phone is. Right. You know, we hear, which is our favorite <laughs> thing, you know? Yeah. yeah. And um, and the parents are very grateful, of course. Uh, yeah. So how do you go? Uh, what is your strategy in order to get out there and get people interested in coming up to uh, Meyer Lake? How are you handling sales? So we have done a few things. Uh, we went on the circuit with a beautiful booth um, to a few of the locations that had direct flights, Los Angeles, Minneapolis, 
um, Chicago, uh, you know, any place that we could attract people from immediately. You know, LA is a great one, five hour, five hour plane flight. Uh, Minneapolis is an excellent one. Big family groups typically come from there. Yeah, um, totally. You know, uh, when we do these shows, we'll spend an extra day and make sure that we go around shaking hands to the local uh, travel agencies. You know, we still think that the largest group of these big families that are coming up are using these services. So it's been very beneficial for us to reach out to the sort of, you know, travel agents. I, that are, completely, that are localized. I completely agree, Steve. And I think that people don't give um, travel. I, I wouldn't call them agents as much as travel planners or travel advisors right. as much right yeah. now, because there yeah. you can book something on your own. Right. But if you really want to create a curated experience and if you right. are somebody that's got the income level that can, you know, do something fun like this, I think you right. want to be handheld a little bit through the process to really well, understand what you can do. I wouldn't assume, look, the every, like I sent you that first box full of uh, brochures. Uh, brochures. It's mm-hmm. very confusing, you know? It's um, almost so, so overwhelming, I don't know where to begin, right? Okay, you know, and here's the thing is, Alaska's not Disneyland. There is an adventure land, or this land, or that land. Uh, I will mention, though, that that one book that I did put in there is yeah. probably the best version of it, because it does separate it into, yeah, right. you know, ideas, and glacier really cool. country, gold country. Okay, so that has been to our benefit, but... Why would I assume that the customer that's beyond the one that I'm going to touch is not going to have the same experience? So reaching out to these, you know, travel planners or agents, call them what you will, has been our um, our most successful way of getting people here because mm-hmm. it does require right. a 10 month span, so to speak, in order to corral, you know, right. 14 people to show up Whew. all at once. That's a that's a it's a real long uh, sales process for you. So how, you you're able to yeah. make the economics work with um not that many rooms and a shortened season and all of that kind of stuff you know it's interesting this is our target experience this is the type of thing that we love doing these week-long 10 12 14 people you know this is what we live for this is why we sort of got into it but uh, you know make no mistake if it was just a hotel it does very well on its own um you know we are busier than we can imagine you know we have a vibrant breakfast program you know uh and we're in sort of an, uh, a food desert, you know, right. so um, we quickly realized that, you know, we have a full size commercial kitchen here and essentially a restaurant. So now it's becoming a restaurant, you know, um, we do our, our chicken dinner meals in the wintertime, you know, to bring in a local audience. You know, uh, we're still very busy when it comes to wedding interest. Um, but the hotel on its own, uh, let's just say uh, if we just left it, nobody would be complaining. Wow. That's a yeah. that's, that's pretty incredible to me. So no wonder why you wanted to get involved in something like this. It's different. It's interesting. Yeah. It's got to be a really yeah. unique challenge. But you're also not all freaked out about about whether you can make the economics work. That's pretty freaking cool. Well, thank you. It has. Um, I mean, I'm not going to act like I haven't lived, uh, lost any sleep. Over hey, we it all lose time. sleep over um, something. <laughs> you know? Yeah. Um, it, but in the build out was the portion of that time when we thought, oh, my God, there's we're literally nothing coming in. You right. know, but um, the first year we signed all these people up for wedding. The second year we made good on all the promises of delivering a beautiful hospitality experience to that. And this third year, you know, we are, you know, branching out and finding out which one of these things that we've thrown at the wall is going to make the most sense. Right. You think that um, you might be in a position to add more cabins and stuff like that as time goes on? Absolutely. Um, You know, and that's something that's interesting. That was actually written into my contract that um, no matter where I went after this, I have to be the one to do that. So, yeah, uh, they're talking. um, When we redid the cabins, we sort of uh, put the utilities out there for uh, four additional, uh, I'd say, um, like full little suites, but Mm -hmm. individual buildings. So tiny little maybe A frames or what? Yeah, I think that's cool. Their own parking and kitchen. Yeah, Mm -hmm. I would prefer honestly, and I've never been to uh, to Alaska, but it seems to me the experience Mm -hmm. would be better to have a small little building than be in a giant structure with everybody else. I think it just feels more um, naturey woodsy. Yeah, and that's our thing. I mean, we still have regular old keys. You know, Ah. Uh, everybody gets a key, which they just think is hysterical, and. um, You know, we purposefully, uh, you know, stepped back from the things that standardize that are standardized in the industry because the whole idea was to offer something that was totally opposite of what was, you know, going on. Right. I love it. You know, and we, um, 
we we kind of say when people do a buyout that this is almost like a gigantic Airbnb with staff. Right. (laughs) Yeah, I like that. I like the idea of having that um, sense of feeling like it's just you and your group, but you don't have to be responsible for uh, cooking and cleaning. I mean, right, that, exactly. sounds, yeah. that sounds like the perfect vacation for uh, for, for my family. <laughs> that that that's for sure. Yeah. Um, anything else? Well, we'd that love you... to have you up. Yeah, thanks, man. I would love to get there. <sighs> maybe next, maybe next summer. I'm just looking at this. Uh, I'm looking at these meal options. Yeah, and stuff do like that. it, do it. I know. <laughs> oh goodness. All right. So, any final any final thoughts before I let you do a good, uh, you know, shameless plug for uh, Meyer Lake? Hey, listen, Glenn, thank you so much for this time. It has been a pleasure. And uh, to any of your listeners looking to have, you know, a family-friendly experience, unlike anything else, you know, we welcome them here. Yeah, so Alaska you, is uh, is ready. And you can find them at MeyerLake.com. That's M-E-I-E-R, Lake.com. Drop an email, info at MeyerLake.com. And they are in Wasilla, Fishhook, Hatcher Pass, Alaska. That sounds freaking cool. I got to get up there. Steve Solari, thank you so much for being here. Thank you, Glenn. It was a pleasure. I want to thank all you guys for being here again, and I will be back next week with another episode of the No Vacancy Podcast that is unless I decide to go uh, hang out with the moose in Alaska. See you guys next time. Thanks so much for listening to No Vacancy, the hospitality industry's number one podcast with your host, Glenn Hausman, online at Rouse.media, on Twitter at Traveling Glenn, and on Facebook.com slash Glenn.Hausman. We'll catch you next time.